Welcome. I'm Liam MacArthur. I'm the Deputy Presiding Officer of the Scottish Parliament, but more relevantly for uh, this event, I'm also the Member of the Scottish Parliament for Orkney. I'd like to welcome you all to this online edition of the Festival of Politics 2021 in partnership with Scotland's Future Forum. Uh, this afternoon's event is about the Scottish Islands being on the front line of the climate emergency. We're delighted that so many people are able to join us online today, and I look forward to hearing comments and questions from our audience as we get into our discussion. Scotland's islands have been described as the canary down the mine when it comes to the climate emergency. Since 2000, the rising sea levels, heavier rainfall and frequent powerful storms have been eroding the dunes and mature land that protects many low-lying communities whose well-being and livelihoods are now being altered. In the next hour, we will hear from the island communities already dealing and adapting to the climate emergency on their doorstep, as well as predicting the island's respective futures. To answer these questions, I'm delighted to be joined today by our pan panellists. Uh, you can read more about um, them in, on the festival website, but let me first introduce Dr Sandy Kerr, who's Director of the International Centre for Island Technology at Heriot Watt University's campus in Stromness in Orkney, and Camille Dressler, who's based in Egg, uh, who's Chair of the Scotland Islands Federation and Vice Chair of the European Small Islands uh, Federation. Unfortunately, uh, Ryan Thompson, the Chair of the Environment and Transport Committee at Shetland Islands Council, has been unable to join us uh, due to uh, being unwell, and we send him uh, our best wishes for a speedy recovery. In order maybe just to set the scene, um, there'll be an opportunity for uh, our online audience to put questions and views to the panel throughout the event. If you would like to make a contribution, please enter your question or comment into the question and answer box. Make sure to state your first name and where you are from, and we'll get through as many as we possibly can before two o'clock. I'd like to um, begin, however, by asking both our panellists, what have you witnessed on your respective islands that would substantiate the claim that Scotland's islands are indeed the canary down the mine when it comes to the impact of the climate emergency over the last few decades. And I'll start with uh, Sandy and then come to Camille. So, Sandy, what are your thoughts? Okay, thanks, Liam. Delighted to be here. And yeah, it's a really interesting question. And I, 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 it's something we've often said over many years that we are, you know, sometimes we're a canary down a mine, other times we're a, we're a lighthouse. But in terms of, you know, physical things that we've seen round about us in, in Orkney, you know, we're definitely seeing sort of increased coastal erosion. And that, that's a in Orney, it's a particular um, concern around a lot of our historic monuments, places like Scarab Bray, um, where there's extensive sea defences there already, but that's um, starting to be eroded away. Also around our, our, our built environment, you know, we're a rural community, but it's actually our built environment in Orkney that's being impacted, not so much by coastal erosion, but here sea level rise and flooding, St Margaret's Hope, Kirkwall, we've to put big new flood defences in, in Kirkwall. And also in my uh, hometown of Stromness. Another um, important issue is around increased storminess and how that's causing problems with transport links. Um, one of the obvious ones, uh, ferries are obviously impacted by storminess. But here in Orkney, we have um, some fixed links and barriers between the Churchill barriers I'm alluding to between um, the, the Orkney mainland and the South Isles. And uh, anybody who lives in Orkney is very aware of the sort of increased impact of storminess and wave um, overtoppling um, there. And then this year, rather you know, unexpectedly, um, you know, we've suffered one of the worst droughts for a long, long time. So this sort of extreme sort of weather patterns. But going back to your original sort of point about the canary down the mine as a you know an indicator, a, a, you know, indicating change. The, the trouble with all these things are they're, they're absolutely real and of huge major concern. And what we would expect to see, given the climate change predictions, is that often there are things we do have a long time series of evidence. Um, there's always been storms; they appear they appear to be much worse and more frequent. But one thing I would point to is the environment round about us. And if you look at um, um, seabird populations, for example, and we have very good long-term data on seabird populations. And 
for many species, the numbers have crashed um, in recent years. And we know that a lot of this is to do with the change in the plankton regime in the seas around us, so that sand eels are not as abundant or not turning up at the right time of year. So you've got, yeah, maybe not a canary, but you've definitely got a seagull down the mine as far as Orkney is concerned, but the impacts are widespread in many. Thanks very much for that, uh, Sandy. That's um, very helpful. And I think you've teed up Camille very well um, in, in reference to the, the travel disruption and ferry cancellations, because I, I think um, egg has not been without its issues over recent days. Um, Camille, uh, what, what would be your reflections in terms of uh, your own experience of, of, of islands being the, the canary down the mine? Well, I would definitely concur with Sandy that um, a drought is a problem that is going to be getting, this seems to be getting increasingly worse. It was bad last year. It was becoming quite critical this year as well, particularly for small islands. And um, our membership being spread between the six island areas of Scotland, I definitely can report the same kind of patterns that San Sandy has been mentioning throughout the um, Western Isles, North Sea Shy Islands, Argyll Islands, Highland Islands, Shetland as well. So coastal erosion, uh, a discrepancy between the arrival of migrant birds and insects. So there's a bit of a problem between the um, source, which has not quite arrived, or quite a bit of difficulty with the um, bird population and their, their feed source, the food source. And uh, the pattern of erosion, obviously, which is quite a problem for low-lying islands. Certainly with um, our uh, network um, uh, island innovation, we have been sharing maps of what would happen if the sea level would rise. And there's an awful lot of coastal land that would be under water in our islands. So it's something that we really need to be mindful of and we need to work with our local authority to anticipate and work on mitigation issues quite urgently. Thanks very much for that, um, Camille. I, before turning to the next question, I would um, certainly encourage our, our audience to put their questions in the Q&A function. And as I say, if you could indicate um, our, our first name and where you're from, that would be very helpful. Hopefully, we will be able to uh, do a tour of the country in terms of the comments uh, and the questions over the course of the hour. But just turning maybe to that point you were making there, Camille, about um, some of the, the, the planning work that um, islands undertake, is there something in terms of the, the closer knit nature of, of island communities that allows um, sort of behavioural change to take place um, to, to sort of embrace initiatives to address climate change that might be more difficult in in uh, in more urban areas and 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 are there examples of how that is has happened whether through development I don't know of renewable energy projects or energy efficiency projects or some of the um, flood mitigation that, that that Sandy was talking about earlier. I would say that the islands are generally far-sighted and uh, have anticipated all um, all this and the move to renewables in the first place. So there's been quite a few years that we've been working on mitigation, the effects of climate change and taking the opportunities that arise with the development of renewable for our islands. So, so I think we definitely are ahead of the curve, but where it becomes more difficult is to plan for the future. I mean, what's going to happen if we don't have enough water, would we have to get desalination plants like they do in Sweden and in Ireland, for instance, all solar panel power, of course. But this is this is something that's quite worrying for a lot of islands in looking to the future. But the thing that we have to say is that our population on the islands are really been engaging with the renewable revolution. And for instance, the, the, the good news about North Yale in Shetland um, it's, it's about having this uh, big wind turbine farm, farm um, going ahead. It, it's something that's been impulsed by local population as early as 2012. So it's we are we are mindful of what's happening and we are trying to do something about it. Sandy, if I come to you, I mean, obviously Orkney has has kind of badged itself as 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 a kind of living laboratory, as, as somewhere that is 
taking a lead in, in, in innovating solutions to address some of these these challenges. So, um, I, I mean, I wonder whether you could talk about the experience locally and in, in, in using that size and scale, perhaps. Um, to, to, to good effect in tackling these sorts of issues, and perhaps also learning lessons that may be um, uh, may be useful for for similar kind of projects or, or behavioural change elsewhere. Yeah, it's a very good um, point. This, and it's something I have thought about quite a lot over the years. That you know, why is it that a lot of the um, um, certainly community scale renewable energy initiatives and uh, local energy system sort of innovation is happening in rural areas and particularly in the islands and i think there's a probably a couple of reasons for that and i think that one of them is that i think islanders particularly people living in small islands they're system thinkers they understand everything how everything interacts to make the system on their island work they know how many kids are in the school they understand where their power comes from, where the water comes from, how the ferries work, how interrelated and reliant everything is. Perhaps in a way that you maybe don't in Edinburgh, you turn your tap on and there's water. I wonder how many people know where it comes from. Um, so I think that islanders are, are used to thinking in a systems way, so they can see how fragile it is. and. Um, um, and the smallness of space means that when you're confronted with a problem, you can't just sort of use space to hide the problem. So you're confronted with problems, you understand how everything links up, so you kind of get the idea of energy, you kind of get the idea of sustainable development, you kind of get why renewable energy is important. It's an easier story to explain and tell to people on islands because they, they think that way already. And climate change is a systems problem. You know, it, it's it, it's going to require behavioural change. It's going to require, um, um, you know, uh, new renewable technologies. But it's not just a case of unplugging coal and coal and plugging something else. And you know, how we use energy is going to have to be very different. We're going to have to change how we live our lives. It's it's a systems problem. So I, I think that gives us a head start. And I think the other thing in sort of small tight knit communities is that information diffuses more quickly. And I give you an example um, of that. Um, you know, about sort of 15 years ago, when we had small feed-in tariffs for small wind, at one point Orkney, I, forgive me if my numbers are wrong, but they're approximately right. At one point, Orkney had 20% of the UK installed small-scale wind. That's your household scale stuff, you know, six um, kilowatts. 20% of the UK installed capacity. We've got 0.05% of the UK population in Orkney. Now the whole of the country is getting the same price signal. So what what was that about? Well, I think it's about you know the the you know when when somebody sees that you know wind's a good idea and uh, you know small scale wind works, then that information diffuses and spreads very quickly in the community. So it's a it's a adopted very quickly. So you know th that's why you know I'd say that you know that helps has really sort of helped us put us ahead of the game. So trying to sort of think about met the metropolitan world down south, I think that trying to identify what are the communities that we're going to talk to and that are going to sort of embrace change, because I, I think they're maybe not necessarily geographic when you're in a city, um, whereas you know the island of Egg or or Westry or mainland Orkney, you've got more of an obvious sort of you know what is community is much more obvious. So I think this sort of identifying the community that you're going to try and uh, that, that that needs to needs to change its behaviour is very important. No, that's that's I think very helpful, Sandy. And, and as somebody who was one of those um, connecting micro wind turbines to the to the network, I, I know that uh, um, not only did SSE struggle to keep track of of who was connecting up. Um, but but ultimately it, it it helped create the conditions of of capacity constraints on the on the grid, which has then in turn I think probably um, catalyzed um, more consideration to how we we use local sources of de demand to use up the the kind of production that we've that we've got. I I'm I'm taken by a question that's come in from Amanda in in, in Edinburgh. 
um, about what we've seen Camille and, and Sandy both talking about the way in which maybe islands are um, are well set up to to to, to innovate um, in, in this area. But to what extent, Amanda's asking, are is there a sort of fund for islands to implement? climate uh, adaptation measures? Is there a framework or some other support for councils, members of the public to create climate adaptation plans? Essentially, is government um, uh, supporting the, the, the kind of innovation that both, um, both Sandy and, and Camille, you've been talking about? Who wants to go first? Camille, can I come to you first, maybe? Uh, well, we are very lucky at the moment to have an island plan. So, you know, renewables and production of renewables and making sure that we have the, the skills within the island population to service that industry is, is part of the plan. So, we, are, we have a head start on, on this. But I think um, Amanda's question is very important, and I can compare that with my experience of other countries in Europe, where perhaps the, the whole um, issue of planning is maybe more centralised, and um, I've seen that in Scotland the, the application of um, sustainable energy action plan has may not have been necessarily uh, moved on to sustainably sustainable energy and climate action plans as it is happening in uh, Germany or. Denmark or France, and I think that's something that's really, really important that um, it, it occurs right across the board, and that the council, the local authorities, do work with the local communities to make sure that there is a joined-up approach, and also that there is a political will to, to to support that. And I'm not just saying about the the, the Scottish government, I think we are very like, lucky in, in this country, in Scotland, that we have a very supportive government. But is there the will at the UK government to, to change, the, to change the, the issue? You were mentioning SSE just now, Liam. You know, how come that when there is a, the problem with the subsea cables, say to Tyree or Isla, that go down, um, there is no will from SSE to immediately switch on the capacity on the island. It's not happening. It's it's all the flicker of a switch to a diesel generator system. So there is a need to to a systemic change, definitely. And that requires political will at all level. That's helpful, Camille. I said the, the issue of the, the, the switching to diesel generators is, is certainly an issue we've been Experience in, in, in Orkney with cable faults of late. Sandy, I, to what extent do you think there's been a, a sort of supportive environment around, um, uh, whether from local, national, or UK government to, to support these initiatives? Well, you know, so I'm just sitting here reflecting on the past, you know, and it, you know the, the, the renewable, you know, renewable energy in Orkney is, is something that, um, well. In, you know, it really goes back to the sort of mid '90s when we started looking at it. In terms of specific support for islands, I've got to say very little. And a lot of what happened in Orkney was, the, you know, the islands sort of galvanised. We established the Orkney Renewable Energy Forum um, locally back in the 1990s, just when people really didn't, you know, didn't really know what a turbine, wind turbine was even, or how it worked. It's just a place where we could come and sort of learn. And then actually reach out and grab um, um, money, very often from from the uh, from down south. And I think I, I do think though that uh, one thing that's been really helpful, certainly certainly in Orkney, is the fact that we've got our own local authority. So you've got a a, a local authority based in the islands that uh, you know obviously the councillors are islanders, and so they're very aware of island problems and issues. And you know, kind of going back to what I said in the last comment as well, we you know that the kind of there is a sort of very strong will to work together, um, both in industry, public sector, and you know academia in, in the islands, and that that's what set up the Orkney Renewable Energy Forum, um, the Orkney Renewable Energy Forum as well. It, you know, we conducted energy audits, so we kind of understood our position, um, so we had. Facts and information to 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 support our cause when often you know we went south and grabbed money from south. So 
frankly, in my opinion, very little um, specific island support over the years. Maybe changed a bit now. We've got the Islands Bill. Well, we can argue about how effective that actually is, but that's relatively recent. And um, I'd say very little. What we've done is we've sort of organised and reached out. And often it's been Orkney sort of bullying and cajole, uh, cajoling um, 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 government down south. Thanks for that, Sandy. Right, there's a few questions that have popped into um, into my uh, inbox here. So let me see if I can um, rattle through those. Firstly, um, from Kirsty and Sky, are there any national or local campaigns or programmes that um, the panellists could recommend so that individuals can get involved at a grassroots level? Camille? Well, um, we have been involved for quite a long time in the the clean energy EU islands policies at um, European level, because we have a, uh, our federation is, is member of a federations of island federations throughout the EU. So we've been working on smart, sustainable islands uh, for a long, long time. And I'm pleased to say that, you know, there's been a lot of political um, um, move towards resourcing the islands. So I would say, Go to the Clean Energy EU Island Secretariat website. It's um, easy to find, Clean Energy EU Island, and you have the model for a clean energy transition agenda. Every island community ought to be able to work to produce their own transition agenda. Us on EGG, we have uh, done ours, ours just now, and we are in the middle of uh, sharing it with, with the community to see if we've got it right. Um, it's a blueprint for what you're going to do. Um, obviously, on EGG, we have our own mini grid, so it's slightly different. But if you look on the examples of other um, CETAs, um, clean energy transition agendas elsewhere, like in Ireland or in Sweden or in the Azores or Portugal, it's it's actually a, a very useful template to engage the community and to reflect and to understand their consumption. Um, Sandy was talking about energy audits. It's important to be able to to be able to carry out this energy audit. We at the Scottish Island Federation, together with Community Energy Scotland, we've developed a methodology for local community to do their own audit. We can share that with you. Um, and there are the tools there that are being developed for citizens to engage in their energy transition, and we will be very happy to make sure that these tools are available more widely. Andy, do you want to put in a plug for the Orkney Renewable Energy Forum again, or? Yeah, anything? well, it, I, I will do, and I'll, I'll, I'll advance, <laughs> move it on a little bit. But I, I can't underestimate how, uh, and you know. I, how important that's been, that sort of local organisation, understanding your own island and your own system and having that information. And, it, you know, information is power, because without it, you, you, you can't persuade anybody of anything. You'll be brushed aside all the time. So you need to understand your own island and what's going on. And the Orny Renewable Energy Forum has been absolutely sort of critical in that. And the, as I say, because we've got our own island local authority, that has been hugely helpful because they get it as well. But I, I do want to mention another initiative that um, through the islands deal, which is one of the, the UK's regional deals, um, so the UK government and the Scottish government contribute both contribute money to this. And there's a there's an islands deal, which is Orkney, Shetland, Western Isles. But we, uh, um, Harrywell University, along with local partners, uh, European Green Energy Centre and, and private sector and the council as well, and Community Energy Scotland, are establishing the Island Centre for Net Zero. And this is to sort of really try and understand or help communities work out their own pathway to, to net zero. So um, this is something that, um, you know, uh, once the Island Deal signed off, should be established next year. And, you know, it's the idea is to learn in these islands and then spread that news to the other islands around the UK and the rest of the world, indeed. Hi, Sandy. I'm going to come back to stay, stay with you. Oh, Camille, sorry, you wanted to um... echo this. I think that's um, that Centre for 
net zero is absolutely welcome. It's 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 wonderful because there's going to be a an exemplar for other communities. But we've also got a, a UHI plan to establish um, a SAMSU type energy academy in Malik, and with an, with with um, a close cooperation with the small isles, which all have their own mini grids and Noidart, so that uh, people can come and learn about how to do it and also go and spend time on each of the islands to see how they, they've done it. And for instance, I'd like to commend the example of the Isle of Kana, where a population of 12 has managed to set up their own energy, renewable energy system. It's remarkable, but it's just a question of determination and also getting the right help. And I, was, I have to say that Community Energy Scotland is brilliant because they have um, they have a methodology that can be applied to any community, whether urban, rural, or island. Yeah, no, I think that's that's a, a, a point very well made, um, Camille. Yeah, sticking with the issue of of energy, I've got a question here from Moreg. I don't know where she is from, but she's um, uh, referring to reports of predictions of the reduction in wind in northern Europe with a, a, a simultaneous increase um, a, a around the Mediterranean, wondering whether or not that's indeed the case and whether there are implications for our own renewable energy targets. Sandy, I don't know whether you have any insight into that. I, I, I'm just sort of um, starting to hear about this, the signs coming through now. And um, yeah, it will. Um, I, 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 I suppose there's a lot of uncertainty around um, the extent to, to which this this will happen. I mean, what I would say at the moment, if you look at a, a wind turbine in Orkney um, or Shetland, it's operating at something like maybe 55% efficiency, so it's equivalent to 55% of the time. In the south of England, 30%, um, maybe as low as 20% in Germany or, or southern France, depends where you are. So there's there's quite a long way to go um, before that flips around, you know, um, it, we we are a lot windier, at the, a lot windier at the moment than these other places. So um, let's see. Yeah, Can I maybe just stick with the the energy theme. There's a, a question from Graham again. Um, no indication of where Graham is, but uh, he's asked about whether or not um, the devolution of more powers over energy and energy policy to the Scottish Parliament might improve. And the support available for um, projects in the islands and presumably mainland Scotland as well. Um, and he also asks, how do the feed-in tariffs hinder development due to the higher costs in Scotland contributing to the, the, the grid? I mean, I suspect that's probably more about the new costs than, rather than feed-in tariffs. But Sandy, do you have any any views in terms of the the devolution of of of, of powers? Um, there's no way in saying for sure. It really depends on how it plays out in Edinburgh and Glasgow. Um, it's certainly a lot closer, and you know it's certainly easier to to um, um, connect with Edinburgh. Um, there's a politics within Scotland as well, and there, there is an urban-rural divide within Scotland as well. So um, I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I, I, I think the, the the grid connection charges are are very um, interesting, and that I think sometimes that um, you know the, the grid debate is a, a sort of tricky one. But I look around Orkney, and actually, what I'd like to see is less of a focus on us trying to export our electricity and more of a focus on actually using it locally, um, because we you know we're still driving about predominantly in petrol cars. I'm looking out of this window, a tractor in the field. And um, that's diesel. I can if I actually crane my neck, I can see a ferry um, heading off to the North Isles, and those are huge consumers of energy. So, you know, personally, I, I think I'd like to turn that debate on its head and say, how can we use and we should be focusing on using more energy locally rather than trying to sort of move it around the country. I, yeah, I mean, I think that that points to the the Reflex project um, and similar work yeah. that's underway in Orkney that. I think because of the grid capacity issues, has seen more attention given to 
uh, how we use the resources we have in in the context. And, and, and strangely, that strangely that grid capacity constraints actually stimulated innovation in Orkney as people try to yeah. look for solutions. And and actually, those are the kind of solutions we're going to need everywhere in the future. Yeah, no, I think that's a point point well made. Um, not that the capacity constraints don't necessarily need to be resolved as well, but it's I think forced people to maybe prioritise that issue uh, more than would have been the case otherwise. Camille, um, have you any thoughts on on that? I suppose there's there's the issue there in terms of the devolution of the powers, but actually the the customer market you need for your for, for your energy that those that are paying taxes or customers paying bills that will fund the, whatever support schemes you've got in place. Um, it is going to be bigger within a UK context than it would be in a Scottish context. Well, the feeding tariff, that the end of the feeding tariff, has, as I would say, has been a disaster for for our island communities because a lot of our business model for setting up renewable systems were predicated on the feeding tariff. So it's it's this kind of auction carry on that's been going on is it, it, it's it's not the same. It's it, it's and again, you know, if if the Scottish government had the power to reintroduce feeding tariff, that would be absolutely a game changer because I think it's. For our rural communities and island communities, small is beautiful, and and you need to think about small small system within the islands. I mean, our, our, the decarbonisation of transport is perhaps ahead of the curve in the Orkneys. I think that the Orkney Council has got the the, the largest amount of uh, charging points in the UK. It, it's way behind in the other islands, and and we need to anticipate also the green hydrogen revolution that everybody is talking about at the moment, and we mustn't be left behind. And I've just been to Brittany this summer, and I've just seen a, a small um, hydrogen fueling station, which is the side of a car park, and it's it's powered by solar cells. And you sort of think that, it, you know, an autonomy of 300 kilometers for island vehicles that will keep us going for quite a long time. And also, you got to think of, of electric vehicles as also, uh, uh, you know, part of the general appliances that they can bring to the grid as well. So, it's thinking small, and an island or community-based think thinking, systemic thinking for the island um, at island level, which is, which is important here. But also, there's a need to to um, to think differently about heating, for instance. Fuel poverty is a massive problem throughout Scotland, and district heating, which is uh, a well and tried technology in Scandinavian countries, it is not nearly as developed as it could be. And again, renewable and hydrogen could combine to change everything. And I think that definitely devolution should help with that. But as we have recently seen the disappointing news about the green hydrogen um, project in Aberdeen and uh, not being given priority shows that we're not quite there yet. Yeah. Thanks, Camille. Um, right, I've got a question from an S. Davidson. Um, don't have the first name, don't have um, a location either, but uh, he or she asks, are policies for spaceports, fish farms, cruise ship travel, etc., compatible with a climate emergency? And um, I suppose a more generic um, reflection is: there too much emphasis on employment to the detriment of climate? And I suppose this goes to another question I was going to ask about whether or not climate change exacerbates the the, the age-old um, issue of uh, island depopulation. If the if the jobs aren't there. Um, uh, then the ability to attract and retain population becomes more difficult. But um, is there a, a, a trade-off between um, climate and, and, and development of these kind? Sandy, <laughs> you just run two massive questions together there, Liam. <laughs> um, uh, sorry, I, I forgot the name of the questioner there. In, in broad terms, I agree with you. And, but I, I think that's a massive question. It isn't just a question for islands, and it's a question nationally, internationally indeed, that we are so hung up on the on on three letters GDP um, as a way of measuring um, economic growth and well-being. 
and it doesn't. You can cut trees down and it increases GDP. You burn oil and cause climate change. The faster you do it, the faster it increases GDP. So we, you know, we we've been over reliant on simple measures of growth, which we think um, equate to equate to well-being. Um, I'll, the, in terms of the sort of um, population sort of change on the islands, which is the kind of second part, of the 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 thorny question that sort of Liam ta tagged mm -hmm. on the end there. I think we're likely to see a lot of mixed mixed effects in, 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 in different parts of our islands and and um you know obviously you know issues like you know storminess and you know sort of ferries and um the challenges of transport are you know maybe a kind of disincentive as well. But I've been thinking about this and and that you know um in Orkney um we're seeing an increase in population at the moment and I'm not saying that's directly related to climate change but one of the sort of big draws is actually the um, renewable energy technologies and renewable energy technology and development in Orkney that's drawing in and drawing in, in particular young people. It's enabling Orcadians who've gone away and studied science STEM subjects to come back and get a, do, a good job, as well as sort of drawing in people who come to um, um, study with us in Orkney and then stay and work. And it's actually sort of reversing um, the sort of brain drain and the sort of drain of sort of younger economically active people. And I've seen this for real in Orkney. And that's because of all this sort of renewable energy and energy systems related activity. There's potential sort of real positive benefits for islands that uh, sort of, um, um, you know, uh, grasp the nettle here um, in this energy transition. Um, I was also sort of thinking as well that you know, it, um, there's a lot of people moving to Orkney as well. I mean, a lot of that's been to do with the pandemic, and suddenly they realise that you know you can work from home. Therefore, you don't need to be close to Edinburgh, Glasgow, London, Manchester, wherever. And um, so a lot of people are moving and bringing them jobs with them. And I also, I just kind of wonder, you know, with that increased mobility, you know, maybe with increased drought, increased heat. Um, down south, I don't think anybody found it particularly comfortable in London this year. Never mind the south of France or Greece. Um, that um, you know, maybe our cooler climates are going to be rather attractive. So that might cause people to move in as well. So it's a big topic, that, and I don't think we quite know what's going to happen. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a fair point in terms of the the population increase over the course of the last eighteen months or so. I think people may be reappraising their their work-life balance and, and the opportunity, as you say, to, to 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 work from home, not needing to be physically present, has has opened up opportunities. But uh, um, likewise, I think those higher skill, better paid jobs in 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 the renewable sector has been has been a catalyst too. Camille, how would how would you see um, that kind of? Um, I don't think necessarily an inherent conflict, but the the tension that can exist between development and creating uh, jobs in, in islands and the imperative of, of, of addressing the climate emergency? Well, I would say that um, probably Orkney has been the most successful um, area to sort of benefit from the cruise ship. They're very well organised, but I'm not sure if the cruise ship model of, of is a sustainable model for tourism. And that, that's a larger question here. You know, who is in charge of, of strategy here? Is it a central body, or is it the communities themselves? I think it's very important that the communities themselves are are looking at, at their own sustainable strategy for tourism, where they encourage smaller scale, more authentic experience, and not that sort of like mass tourism that is destroying places and and creating a, a huge amount of issues. I mean, look at Sky at the moment, and the explosions of Airbnbs, which means that we have very not enough housing for our doctors, our, our teachers, our nurses, because they are having to compete with with um, with uh, tourism um, on the large scale. So it's we have to be very careful about what we wish for in terms of development. So the the the, the recent crisis with COVID has shown the potential of islanders to come up with solutions that are 
low scale and rooted in in the culture and the tradition of the islands the, the kind of like you know know how branding and and the products that are really innovative and rooted in the experience of the island and certainly the the website that was developed to sell island project isle 20 has really shown that there was there was a lot of of entrepreneurship going on the island and we're not talking about massive development like fish farms fish farms don't let me don't get me started on this fish farms are important as an employer but they create a lot of issues themselves so perhaps with the development of the green hydrogen there might be you know there will be lots of oxygen produced that will go to 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 waste if we don't use it so perhaps a different way of fish farming perhaps inland fish farming smaller scale which will not pollute our our um, locks and our our sea our coastal sea and and pro cause problem with migration of of our iconic salmon you know so so i think again the concept is being smart and sustainable smart and sustainable island is our mantra basically and that's what we need to think of in terms of development always having this 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 motto in the in the head well let me stick camille with the 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 theme of food um i've got you started on fish farming so we'll stay on the food theme i've got uh, chris from shetland um who says i think that food security is going to be a growing issue especially given our per capita footprint uh, i think that there is needs to be more support for community growing and community supported growing schemes um I just wonder whether, Camille, you're aware of what support is available at the moment uh, and whether you would agree that that's something where um, local governments and national government needs to be far more um, uh, supportive in its, in its approach and the provision of, of funding to allow these uh, schemes to take off. Well, that's a very important question because um, uh, the Scottish Rural Parliament, we touched upon the the new land use partnership and there's a little bit of a worry about this the way this partnership will be working because i think there will be the body that will be allowing um allocating sorry um funding for agriculture and it's very important that islands are represented well within these um, these panels uh, because we need to think about a different type of agriculture, an agriculture that's not going to be uh, exhausting the, the land, but actually help with the soil um, soil health, so that the soil can continue um, sequest, uh, help with the carbon capture. It's difficult for me to understand all this um, concept, but. Uh, I do understand that soil health is critical to carbon um, being retained in the soil. So a good model for agriculture, like regenerative agriculture, which everybody talks about at the moment, is something that should definitely be encouraged. And basically, this is all about traditional model of agriculture. So small scale, uh, um, uh, perhaps, um, you know, cattle but cattle that is good quality cattle that may be more finished on the islands or in the rural area than sent away you know for better quality meat better quality and and also a, a chance to grow more locally instead of having to do all these uh, good miles so absolutely we do need a strategy that will bring uh, the cost of producing food locally down and make sure that we all are aiming towards self-sufficiency. I mean, I live in a very small islands. If the ferry goes tomorrow, we will run out of food very rapidly because there's no way that we can supply enough within the island, even though we have our own orchard, there's a lot of greenhouses and everything, but this needs to be encouraged more. Uh, the real cost of agriculture needs to be factored in also. Thanks, Camille. I'll ask Sandy. I mean, obviously, the climate at the moment determines to a large extent what food is produced, um, how livestock are, are are raised in the islands. Um, I mean, what what observations would you make in relation to that um, issue of, of food security? 
Yeah, it's um, it's an interesting issue, sort of climate change, food, meat production, and particularly sensitive one in Orkney. Uh, it's, uh, I'm sure Liam well, well, Liam well understands. It's a, you know, we're a, a, the backbone of the Orkadian economy is beef production, and it's not about self-sufficiency. You know, we're an exporter of, of high-quality beef, and uh, I mean, most of the audience, I'm sure, will be aware that. You know, lots of questions being asked about um, the sustainability of, well, you know, meat eating in, in the longer run. Um, I, I think what we definitely need to do is um, we need more information because a lot of the information that's been coming forward about um, meat consumption is about, um, you know, uh, um, cattle lots on, in, in South America and North America, and it's, it's very sort of aggregated. Um, data. Um, I was also at a, a very interesting presentation last week, funnily enough, but it was a, a speaker came to the Orkney Renewable Energy Forum um, to talk about how food supplements, um, seaweed supplements and cattle feed might have the opportunity to sort of bring down methane production from cattle, you know, by something like 60 percent. Um, now, okay, this was research that had been done in the States and a very different kind of agri mode of agricultural production, but you know, nevertheless, there may be ways that we can um, um, produce beef in Orkney and cut the carbon significantly. I'd also hope that because we're producing a, a very high quality, high end product, and that's what you know farmers strive to do in Orkney, that if people more gen population more generally cuts down in its meat meat consumption, it will be the lower end, cheaper stuff that people all sort of move out of their life, and um, and you know maybe that uh, we should um, treat meat consumption as as the kind of you know the treat that it is as something sort of special rather than something every day. And if that's the case, someone like Orkney should be well placed to to. Uh, uh, to be part of that market going forward, but there's no doubt about it. It's a, it's a tough issue, and again, it, it, until you've got hard facts, until we actually really understand, you know, the, the situation on the ground in the islands, then you can have a lot of hot air in arguments um, without any kind of resolution or, or understanding the way forward. So, you know, my first objective would be try and understand it better. Well, I've got a question from Jean in Isla. I'm not sure whether this is more for Camille than Sandy, or indeed whether it's for me. Um, it's a reference has been made to the benefits of having a unitary island authority. Do you think that there could be benefits to there being a new authority for the islands of Highland and Argyll? I mean, I suppose the observations would be that the Islands Act emerged out of work done by the three Island Authority, Shetland, um, Orkney, and, and the Western Isles, but the the, the legislation itself um, quite deliberately touched on um, islands within uh, Argyll and Butte and Highland Council area as well. Um, but I suppose a, a, a unitary authority, including all of the islands from Argyll and, and Highland, may have some benefits. But I could see some 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 potential um, tensions arising um, there in, in terms of the often the zero sum game that can be played between islands that have the the same but competing interests for infrastructure and and, and other such things. Camille, this is this is your neck of the woods. Do you see this as um, something of a of, of a panacea probably for for it, reflecting, I suppose, the, um, the 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 islands' interests and allowing them to kind of punch above their weight. Um, where decisions are, are, are taken, whether about policy or funding. That, that is true. That it is a big issue because um, if you consider North Ayrshire and they have only got two islands, so obviously the island of Arran and Cumbria have a lot of more difficulty to get the point of view heard at council level than, say, Westray and um, would have in Orkney. Um, so I am totally sympathetic to the point of view that Jean has. For Argyll and Butte, there's a substantial amount of islands. It, the Argyll and Butte Council has got an island representative, an island forum, and but they have always been, 
people might would understand, a little bit jealous of the way that Orkney, Shetland and Western Isles have managed to get um, their strategies more aligned because they are island authorities. So, you know, for the Our Island, Our Future, for instance, which impulsed the whole island bill, um, Angel and Butte were always sort of saying, well, we don't seem to be including as much as we could be. So there's merit in in having more strength for the islands in that do not have their own authority. But I think that's a question that needs to be looked at in more details. Certainly in Highlands, um, Rasi, the small isles do work together and Sky is slightly different because it's got a bridge, but it's. I think the distance involves are so large between Sky, say the tip of Sky and uh, and Isla, that it would be difficult to work out a central point, and it maybe need a lot more work to be done before we can come to a conclusion on that. Okay. Um, I, I notice you referred to Westry getting its voice heard. As somebody who's brought up in Sandy, I don't think Westry has any difficulty getting its voice heard, uh, and, and all power to it. Sandy, I don't know um, I, whether you'd have any observations. Yeah, I mean, it's, just, it's been a benefit having the island authorities. I think you you yourself referred to it on a couple of occasions um, that unitary authority and, and, and allowing a, a sort of collective voice to be um, to be expressed. I, I, I think it does, and it, you know, I've got to say on a number of levels, partly because the councillors are islanders as well, and it's what I said about islanders kind of understanding the this system's thinking. Also, the council in Orkney, um, it, it's also the harbour authority. It controls that might not want to. It has to operate the inter-island ferries. Um, it's a big energy consumer itself. So it's quite, um, you know, having the council on board um, when you're trying to strategise about energy in the islands is, is you know, hugely helpful. I, I'll, I'll say something else which might be a bit, you know, a tiny bit controversial. But um, we also have um, in Orkney, most of the councillors are independent. And um, I think that makes a difference. Now, some people say it can cause confusion. Um, in terms of policy coming forward, but I do think it means that you get a hearing, and they tend to, you know, they will listen and and be persuaded by arguments and are not looking over their shoulder at their colleagues in their party or have to take the party line from um, somewhere else in the country. So it's my, you know, some people some people disagree with me on that, but um, I personally I quite like it having independent councillors. That um, they will listen and they'll you know, talk to each other as well. That'd be a retaliation for me throwing the cruise ship question <laughs> at you, uh, Camila. You wanted to come back in, sorry. Back to Jean's Maybe. question. It, it maybe is a question of resources here as well, and I can understand her question very well because if you take uh, Argyll and Butte, it's a it's a massive area, and it it maybe is the problem, and it's the same problem with Highland. We have councils that are so huge and so overstretched that the the resources to to service the islands become very tenuous in the end. So th there is definitely merit in in perhaps making some of our councils smaller. It might be a good idea to have maybe Argyle Ag and do sort of split, um, but I'm not too sure if you you could have um, um, an island authority that would just group all the islands that are not. In Western Isles, in uh, in uh, Orkney or, or Shetland, it's it's a, it's a difficult problem there. But there is definitely a need to have more resources for islands because I know that Argyll and Butte uh, uh, resources are very stretched. When we were working with them on energy issues, they could do a they could do a sustainable energy plan for one island, but not all the islands. It, it was just like a question of resources, and it, it's true, it's a big problem. Well, look, I'm going to see your controversial statement, Sandy, and raise you one um, again from S. Davidson um, around questioning whether or not depopulation of the islands is indeed a, a bad thing um, or a negative issue, or is it just because the cost to local authorities 
uh, to sustain basic services um, for a smaller number of people um, is, uh, is more of a challenge. I, I suspect we're getting into territory of a whole different um, themed event for a future festival of politics there. Um, so, and I'm conscious of time here, so I'll not necessarily bring you bring you in on that. Um, I, I, I think we've probably um, exhausted the uh, I guess exhausted the questions. Um, oh, here we go. Let me finish off with one more. I, Matt in in Shetland. Um, the, the issue with independent councillors is the lack of an organised opposition holding leadership to account. Um, I mean. Sandy, I think when you introduced the the the, the question you um, or the, the comment, you did indicate that it, it wasn't necessarily a universally held view. I suppose the other the other issue is um, there's not necessarily always a great deal of clarity about what a manifesto or what what they would look to achieve over the the, the, the term. There's of always our... there's always a flip side, and there's uh, yeah yeah, yeah. No, I, I can see that El yeah. elegantly dealt with. Um, I think at that point, um, I, I, I'm going to have to start drawing things to a close. Um, thank you very much indeed uh, for all the contributions. And, and sorry, we didn't manage to get to all of the questions and comments in the box. But before we close, I'm going to offer our panellists, uh, offer Sandy and Camille, uh, an opportunity to sum up for them what's been the key point, the key reflection. Uh, on the discussion. Um, I, I'll, I'll tie it in maybe even to a question from Jane in Edinburgh, who, as well as um, thanking the panel for a fascinating discussion, um, asks if there's one sentence, how would you advertise the need to think out of the box in relation to climate change? So I don't know. I'll give you the, cho the, the choice as to whether to um, reflect on that or whether there's something else that you think is just the, the burning issue from the discussion we've had over the past hour. And I'm going to start with you, Camille. I think the whole thing is a sort of uh, getting the, this awareness at community level. Um, OK, in islands, it's, it's easier because our communities are very tight-knit. And, and as, um, as Sandy pointed out, we, we are a systemic thinker. But there's no reason why we can't have um, a, a tenement block being uh, an island within the city. So if, if you if you can have in an urban context lots of little islands of neighbours or neighbourhoods that are thinking about the issue of climate change together, then they could put pressure to get to a system which will benefit them in terms of fuel poverty, in terms of district heating, in, ter in terms of transport. So it's 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 all about being close to your local representative and make sure that your voice is heard. And that's maybe we are better at doing that in islands because we are closer to our politicians, we are closer to our representatives, and we are we're quite feisty as well. We 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 know we can see so clearly the relationship between our lives and the changes and climate change, and and we want to do something about it. Question of awareness and community engagement for me. As the leader of the Basque Nationalist Party once told me uh, many years ago, um, the, the benefits of devolution are that the bums are closer to kick. Um, I think that uh, sums it up um, not too badly. Sandy, how, how would you uh, reflect on this discussion or advertise the need to think out of the box in relation to climate change? I would just like to say I think I totally agree with everything Camille said and, and just reflect on you know our discussion and the comments. I think that um, Nobody's going to come and sort it out for us, yeah. <laughs> and there's a limit to how far just complaining about somebody south or even further south will get you. Probably not very far. I'm not saying the people south or further south are um, right far from it, but it, it's about islands organising. You've got to organise. You've got to understand your own place and understand the energy in it and what it needs and and figure out a pathway forward. Nobody else is going to do that for you. So, you know, without that kind of sort of willingness to sort of organise in your own space, then you're you're not going to get very far. I think the other thing is to is to try and stay optimistic, um, because without that, <laughs> you just lose the energy to 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 do anything. And you know, I do reflect on my own small town of Stromness. 
and you know how it is you know how it's expanded it's 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 um got this amazing sort of mix of international and local people um international people that are coming here to understand what these islands um are doing in terms of uh, and and under learn from the green revolution that's happening here and nobody started that from down south it was the islanders that did it themselves i think that point about islanders having a kind of can-do attitude. I, 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 the number of people who say to me yeah. after visits to Orkney, um, but I'm sure it's the case in, in other islands as well, that there's a can-do attitude there and that's what, what strikes them. And, and, and I suppose if you're in government, it, it's far easier to, to look at how you might get alongside and back something that's underway, that's well-formed, has the, the buy-in of, of the local population, et cetera. Um, and you can support it along the way than starting from from scratch with a problem that you don't really know how to how to deal with. So I I think that's a a, a point very well made. Look, let's let's conclude on this optimistic note. Um, can I thank everybody for their contributions, for their questions, for your comments? Apologies that we didn't manage to get to all of them, but thanks in particular to um, to give them his Sunday name, Dr. Sandy Kerr. Uh, and to Camille uh, Dressler for giving up their time to, to take part um, this afternoon. Um, can I also take the opportunity to remind everyone watching that the festival continues later on today with panels on climate activism in This Is Not A Drill at 6 p.m. tonight. Then tomorrow we have panels on technical and financial innovations uh, to save our world in Big Brains for Big Solutions. Uh, followed by a panel about the Global North's part in the climate crisis in Is the North to Blame, as well as sessions on mental health and COVID-19 and inequalities. So I do hope you can join us, but for now, thank you very much indeed uh, for your participation, uh, for supporting the Festival of Politics. Have a good afternoon and the rest of the weekend. Thanks very much yeah. indeed. Thank you. It was a pleasure. <laughs>